Hello friends and family and welcome to our boring meditation stuff for Thursday, October 15th. We are seriously considering leaving this place now um, to the point of, of booking flights <laughs> and that sort of thing. And coincidentally, I am reading uh, Octavia E. Butler's Parable of the Sower, which is a sort of, not exactly post-apocalyptic uh, view of humanity and the earth, particularly the Western United States, but um, a look at a time, uh, for, she wrote it in 1992, I believe, and the book begins in 2024, um, and the predictions she makes are that Climate change will drain the earth of fresh water and um, that humans will revert to a sort of animal nature, um, which isn't that hard to believe necessarily, but the main character sort of progresses forward through the book, um, observing and battling with this sort of uh, regressive animal survivalism of other members of society where the the ultimate conclusion seems to be hunter be hunted killer be killed and it's an interesting perspective and it's an interesting position to put the characters in um, or any person and the specter of death is always it's always there <laughs> sometimes more strongly than others so as we mentally prepare ourselves to take flights um, we have to go through this exercise of considering the very real possibility that we will be seriously infected in an airport or more likely on the flight itself and that we will have to deal with the consequences of that. And this is actually, oddly enough, one of the deeper aspects of meditation. If on one side of the equation you have <clears throat> Butler's post-apocalyptic world of the ultimate survivalism and on the other hand you have a, a willingness to accept death then one of the ultimate aims of meditation is to prepare people the meditator to transition from this animal survivalism toward a willing acceptance of death. Death will come. There is no immortality and technology has not advanced far enough that um, we need to financially battle others <laughs> to survive for longer. Um, not on the orders of hundreds of years, at least. Um, this pseudo-immortality that technology will probably bring us at some point. At present, wealth brings you, at most, about a century's worth of time on Earth and a healthier time at that. And the sort of poverty that Butler's characters are enduring is a post-modernity poverty. They are familiar with the comforts of a modern world, a modern 21st century United States, um, before or as it collapsed.
there are two states here which are really highlighted in Butler's book. One is disease. So the idea that healthcare is not readily available, it's not widespread, and death, that someone might shoot you or cut you or, or kill you in any other fashion. These are two of three aspects that meditation is meant to prepare us for. The third is just old age. Old age in and of itself comes with all sorts of discomforts. So old age has its own peculiarities, its own diseases, um, its own malfunctions. Naturally, the body begins to decay before it dies. It, it is decaying right now. <laughs> Even a baby's body is decaying on some level. But of course, old age isn't exacerbated by the collapse of the economy or the collapse of the climate. Old age is old age. But diseases and premature death um, are very real aspects of the world in which a collapsed humanity must live through. And it's interesting because for many of us, we don't really know modern discomfort. We don't know extreme poverty. We don't know real physical suffering, not like that. But many people do, far fewer than people think um, in the quote unquote developed world, level four countries, level four societies. Um, the World Bank uses four measures of economic growth for countries and uh, level four is the highest. Level one is the lowest, that's extreme poverty. To be in India is to see a great many level three households, some level two households, and few, but some level one households. Level one households are uncommon as a site. Um, a level one household has essentially nothing. Um, a good measure would be a toothbrush. Uh, how many toothbrushes, if any, exist within the household? Um, if the entire family shares one toothbrush, that's probably a level one household. And although we may be saved circumstantially from ever experiencing a level one or a level two life, we are not free of old age and death. And as the pandemic shows us, we are not free of disease. Um, we may hide from it, but there is always a possibility that it will cross our path. As such, we are not invincible. Um, anyone friend, family, or otherwise watching this video, listening to me speaking in English on uh, a computer or a phone, almost certainly lives a level four life. Um, and a level four economy, a level four household, a level four country, level four society is a comfortable life. You can go to a hospital, you can go to a doctor, 
um, in Canada, we have universal health care. These are real comforts, but they don't make us invincible. And at the highest the highest rungs of this ladder of meditation, there is invincibility. And it is often written into other documents as such um, in a literal sense, or at least using literal imagery. Um, I think that my favorite is um, the Tao Te Ching. The Tao Te Ching describes this state as one where uh, no sword can pierce such a person, I mean, that they can wander the wilderness without fear of rhinoceros or tiger, <laughs> um, which is cute. The imagery is literal, literally a tiger, um, but the idea is clearly not. There, there is no way to imbue the body with invincibility. You cannot. <laughs> you will never be eternal. You will never be invincible. Um, there are no such superpowers. But we've all witnessed in our lives those who are suffering deeply, who are dying, who are experiencing disease, incredible pain. And there is a real visible apparent spectrum even amongst those of mundane achievements that some will really suffer and indulge their suffering and may even relish is the wrong word but commit themselves perhaps to that suffering and there are all sorts of sufferings which lay on top of the initial sufferings there are the sufferings of decay and pain and then there are the sufferings of, of fear and self-pity and everything else that a person applies and uh, naturally a person applies these people these feelings to themselves as they pass pass through great pain as they pass through the gateway into death and on the other side we've all seen those who are able to manage these transitions, these storms in their lives. Um, people who do it well tend to be old. <laughs> they tend to have seen some things. It does, it's not usually the 15-year-old who is astounding us with his or her mental resiliency, though it happens. But it's usually our elderly who show us incredible courage, awareness of the truth of death, and a certain comfort with those ideas. Within the mundane sphere, 
I would say the strongest collective example of this that I can think of was the the damage to the nuclear power plants in Japan which caused the nuclear power plants power plants to melt down in such a way that they could not be repaired and could not be salvaged um, but through direct human intervention they could at least be quelled um, there were certain measures which could be taken but a person had to go into the plant to take those measures and a number of Japan's elderly volunteered to do this volunteered to suffer incredibly um, for the sake of others for the well-being of others because they knew they were closer to death and that's a very rational calculation <laughs> This is not the sort of cal this is the sort of calculation you could read in a book and think to yourself, "Ah, yes, that's what I would do. Oh, I would be brave. Oh, I would take the sword. Oh, I would take the bullet. I would walk into a nuclear power plant." And it's one of the early, very early stages in our meditation practice to cross this line to know we would not and most of us would not to know that our actions are guided often more often than not by fear and by survivalism than they are by selflessness and heroics. And in learning this, I remember when I learned this about myself, I remember it quite distinctly. I think it was the seventh or eighth day of my first Vipassana course, I had a real image of myself <laughs> um, that was broken down. An image of myself where I thought, oh, if someone needed help, that uh, no matter the cost, no matter the personal cost, I would always provide that help. And the first step in this process is to know your limit, to know when you would not. Of course, then further steps are to push that limit, to learn to make space for other people, to learn selfless behaviors. Learning them is slow, <laughs> but this is the only way that I'm aware a person can even learn such behaviors. And in doing so, we become more comfortable with death or vice versa. Because we become more comfortable with death, more comfortable with rationality, we are able to make the right choice at the right time. We can say, well, that man has a knife or a gun I don't freeze, I don't feel my body filling with heat and trembling, but I calculate, I think through the course of action, or maybe it's thoughtless, maybe it's a sort of impulse, but it's a rational impulse. And 
this is the interesting side of ethics in meditation where ethics in the world of animal behaviors these survivalists in Butler's book some of it is thought through and some of it is impulsive what they do and if you hear stories of war if you hear stories of desperate populations you hear of behaviors which are hard to believe and those behaviors are often based on fear often based on survivalism at what stage does one resort to cannibalism does one consider that an ethical boundary that i will never resort to cannibalism and there's a sort of bi-directional relationship here between the set of ethics one chooses tries to choose sitting here with no immediate apparent danger um, i can choose my set of ethics what are the morals i want to live by and in attempting to enact those then the impulsive the reactionary part of me is brought forth automatically a meditator or no if someone is not a meditator then it's a matter of nature and nurture right your biology and the way that you were raised the circumstances of your life <laughs> some of them effectively random and some of them much more systematic the school you went to the teachers you had who your parents were who your friends were all of this condenses to any given moment any given decision that you make any given impulse you have and you react and so when we meditate we train ourselves not to react it's a strange little exercise and the training is very narrow and very simple in anapana but it's the same and the goal is just to maintain our attention don't react to anything oh well, thought has come oh, okay i'm not reacting maintain my attention on the breath repeatedly repeatedly because <laughs> we will react we will always react and outside of this mundane sphere the mundane being cannibalism on one end and the heroics of the Japanese elderly in the nuclear power plants on the other end outside of that mundane sphere there are spaces to visit which involve supramundane ethics supramundane understanding of one's own self Supramundane is not necessarily exciting. It's not magical. If I ask myself the question, sitting here, rationally, consciously, would I take a bullet? <laughs> um, my conscious mind, my rational mind, will probably try to convince me that I would that I would always do the right thing that I would save someone in trouble uh, that I would save a loved one certainly um, and it is only with 
the penetration of the unconscious mind, which is the exercise that we're doing in meditation. that we can see the actual answer to the question. Our conscious mind can never provide us this answer because we can, unless we happen to be in that situation. And even then we only have the answer for that very specific situation. How much coffee did I drink that morning? What did I have for breakfast? Was I in a good mood or a bad mood? That determines our answer <laughs> for that day, for that moment. And the next day, maybe we would react, react completely differently. And so to know the answer to the question, um, whatever that question may be, the question is, would I take a bullet? Would I be able to sacrifice something, particularly myself, like that? Um, the answer lives only in the unconscious mind. And I think as I read through Butler's book, it's very easy to be critical of the characters, um, particularly not the main characters, but the supporting characters who behave in ways that seem irrational or selfish or downright evil. It's easy to judge them from the comfort of my bed <laughs> or the balcony with coffee in one hand. But the truth is, until the apocalypse, apocalypse comes, we don't know how we would react in that situation. We probably wouldn't resort to cannibalism, but we might do some very surprising things. And to prepare ourselves for either the cartoonish apocalypse of Butler's novel or the very real apocalypse we all face, our individual death, to consciousness, to awareness, that is apocalypse, that, that is the end of everything. Um, to prepare ourselves for that, we meditate. And this ultimate supramundane state, absolutely deathless, that we ascribe no special value to the self, total egolessness, this is not our aim. Well, maybe on some very high level, this is the aim, right? Um, but that's sort of like saying that ultimately the aim of a pickup game of basketball is to star in the NBA. The aim of a pickup game of basketball is to derive value out of that immediate game. <laughs> so we want to enjoy the game. We maybe want to get a little bit better. We want to breathe heavy and sweat. And that is what today's meditation is about. Um, if in the future we happen to enter into a deathless state, well, good for us. But I don't think that that is a target for any of us. A much more likely case is where any one of us faces our inevitable demise, our inevitable death, or even externally, the death of another, a loved one, a close friend, and we're able to face it, particularly our own death, with equanimity, with poise. I think I can safely say that if I were to die tomorrow, I probably wouldn't face it with much poise. <laughs> I'm no great meditator, but the goal is 
to be ready when death comes, whenever that happens to be. So um, in the few years I've been meditating, I will be that much more ready were death to come tomorrow. And I have no idea. I have no control over that. But assuming I live a long and relatively healthy life, I will have that many more years to prepare. And hopefully, should the apocalypse descend on us between now and then, I will not resort to cannibalism. I think that's probably enough for today. Uh, I hope everyone is taking good care of themselves and good care of everyone around them. And I will talk to you all tomorrow. Goodbye.